Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Game Nintendo.com video we're going to be discussing memory as in a computer RAM. Now, memory itself is quite a broad topic, so this is going to be a fairly brief overview that's probably still going to be turning into quite a lengthy video regardless on exactly what is memory and how it works as well as the memory hierarchy as memory on a PC is not all created evenly. In other words, there is different levels of memory on a PC, or indeed a console or whatever. Now to most people, if you were to say memory on PC, you would automatically think of the main system RAM, you know, the 8 gigabytes of DDR3 or the 4 gigabytes of DDR3 or whatever you happen to be using on your system. And while that is probably the socially accepted amount of uh, term of memory, in reality, it's actually nowhere near as um, simple as that. In reality, there are lots of different types of memory in your system, and they all have specific jobs. Now, I'm not going to get too much into unified memory, because I probably will make that a separate video. I'm going to go into the the benefits and the cons of unified memory in a future video because I want this to be a brief overview. Um, this is going to probably answer just about all of your main questions of RAM but I'll definitely probably well most likely go into a more specific sets of videos in the future. As it turns out memory is well a storage device fairly obviously with a finite resource. In other words, just like CPU speed, you can only have a certain amount of RAM. Now, as it turns out, RAM can operate at different speeds, uh, or memory can operate at different speeds, but you can't, for example, add more uh, by simply overclocking it. Now, overclocking, of course, is the principle of running a part faster than it should be. For example, let's say you have a 2 gigahertz processor and you say overclock it to, say, even a minuscule amount, say 2.1 gigahertz, that's 100 megahertz more, you have, in effect, overclocked the CPU. You can do the same with RAM. So, for example, if your graphics card memory is running at 1000 megahertz, you overclock it to, say, 1200 megahertz, you have given it a 200 megahertz overclock. That's simple. However, you can't do anything to actually ex increase the amount of memory. There are compacting programs and technically stuff like WinRAR and various other zip applications do compress uh, files in the memory, but you're not actually increasing the amount. You'd have to physically add more RAM or, say, a bigger hard disk or whatever. So anyway, I think now we've covered the very, very, very basics of what in memory. I'm pretty sure most of you knew that already. But let's now go into what is known as the memory hierarchy. Now, what the heck is a memory hierarchy? As it turns out, a PC, or should I say computers, have what is known as a hierarchy of performance. In other words, as I was saying earlier, memory is more of a storage device. It's not simply a medium of, say, RAM. Now, as it turns out, there are a plethora of different um, memory types. Now, it depends upon the device you are using. And some of these, for example, a Blu-ray device is not um, going to be in, say, a cell phone. But on the other hand, um, processor registers or, say, cache, maybe. So anyway, we'll start at the very beginning. Processor registers, um, they are very, very, very fast, and they are part of the CPU die. And now, this is memory, if you will, that is part of the actual CPU and this data is used specifically mostly anyway for the ALU ALU or arithmetic and logic units they are actually controlled directly by the compiler in other words they pretty much hold the data um, that the CPU is about to process as it turns out CPUs generally speaking will hold multiple types of registers and it can be anything from say data registers which can hold uh, numeric values for example integers floating point values various other bits and pieces or it could be something a little bit different such as registers which are actually yet used to fetch information from the memory itself or should I say the main system RAM 
Then there is the actual CPU cache. Now, to really simplify this, CPU cache is on the CPU die, but it's not actually part of the CPU. The purpose of the uh, CPU cache is basically to hold pieces of information that are frequently accessed by the CPU. Generally speaking, there will be a multiple levels of cache, for example, level 1 at level 2. Level 1 cache, for example, has less latency and so on. So basically, the level one, as level 1, uh, if level 1 doesn't have the data, then it will move on to level 2, possibly level 3, depending on the type of CPU that you're using. So basically, before the CPU processes anything, it will check these uh, either the register or it was rather to check the cache and then if it does not have the memory available the instructions available the data available on any of these caches it will say okay then guess I have to move on to the actual main system RAM now the memory itself is pretty fast but certainly nowhere near the speed of say the cache on the CPU random access memory can vary in size from a couple of gigs now to say 8 gigs, 16 gigs, 32 gigs, whatever you happen to be using on your system. Now this along with say the processor's cache, this memory will lose the data if you switch off the PC. In other words, it has a limited shelf life. Now for example, if you were to put your PC into standby mode, what happens is that the data is then put on to a hard drive in that state. So it very much saves the state of whatever work you're using in a very loose sense of the word anyway. So there are a couple of types of different memory, for example, DDR1, DDR2, DDR3, and so forth. And then you have memory, which is typically um, restricted or used, shall I say, on, say, video cards, which would be, say, GDDR5. Now, as it turns out with the likes of, say, GDDR5, it can also be used for unified system memory as well which you can see on something like, say, the PlayStation 4 or even the Xbox 360. Now, I'm not really going to get into the benefits and the negatives too much on this particular video because it's already going to be quite lengthy, I feel. But basically, the difference is that if you have, say, a video memory, instructions will be typically put onto the graphics card RAM itself, providing that that card has enough data to be able to fit all of the instructions and the data within it. If it doesn't, it may have to farm out to, say, the main system memory, or if that's taken up, or depending on how it's programmed and so forth, the application, it could even have to start swapping from the hard disk. Either way, that's going to start battering the PCIe bus. As a rule of thumb right now, however, most cards do have more than enough RAM. If you have, say, 1.5 gigabytes of RAM, you've probably got enough for, say, 1080p, uh, decent levels of anti-aliasing and anthropic filtering on even games such as, say, Crisis 3. Obviously, however, if you are starting to ramp up the levels of texture filtering, uh, anti-aliasing, and running on a very high um resolutions such as triple monitors or say 2560 by say 1600 then you might start having issues with only 1.5 gigs of RAM but anyway there is also what is known as a memory wall and this is a disparity between the speed that CPU and memory outside the CPU can be accessed. Now this is one of the things that the developers of the PlayStation 4 were somewhat talking about in various interviews. Um, it's not a huge deal right now. It is it's not as bad as what some people may think. So how much memory does memory bandwidth really play into this? Well, I'm probably going to talk about this more in a separate video, but I want to at least cover it for the sake of prosperity, shall we say. And as it turns out, it depends upon the application. For example, um, Tom's Hardware have a pretty good article on this, and they were using the i7-975 Extreme Edition. And they were basically testing it on a different types of DDR3 RAM from uh, DDR3 800 megahertz all the way up to a DDR3 1600 megahertz and with different levels of um, memory settings apart from that. In other words, cast latency and whatever else. 
So how much of a difference actually is there? Well, for example, on Far Cry 2, 1.0.1, uh, and this would be at 1280 by 800 with medium settings. Why those settings are here, you scream. Well, quite simply, it's so that you're not putting strain on the video card. Because obviously, if you start to turn up the resolution and the graphics settings, your video card's now being forced to do more work. Therefore, it's better just to get a CPU and memory system reading by turning those down so that you don't have any problems with the GPU at all. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, DDR3 800 puts out 111 frames per second, whereas the DDR3 1600 puts out around 114. It's 113.9 if you want me to be precise, but I'm just going to round it up because I don't think anyone really cares about 0.1 of a f uh, frame. Meanwhile, GTA 4, uh, 1280 by 1024, um, you're looking at DDR3 on 800 megahertz to be putting out at 61.8, so let's just call it 62 frames per second. DDR3, 1066 actually puts out the best performance because it actually has tighter timings. You're looking at 62.7, whereas on the other hand, something like DDR3 1600, which actually has slightly looser timings, you're getting a 62.3 frames per second. On the other hand, Left 4 Dead um, 1, which would be at 1280 by 800 um, resolution, medium settings, you've got DDR3 1600 at 194.6 frames per second, and DDR3-800 with pretty tight timings at 180 frames per second. So it's quite a difference there. So you can see what I mean. Right now, it's not an absolute huge deal. Um, and in most cases, we don't really need the extra bandwidth. However, if CPUs continue to move forward, obviously we, it will become a bigger problem. Obviously, CPUs now are becoming a lot more efficient and with bigger caches as well, which somewhat negates the problem. As an aside, by the way, we will be moving on to DDR4 in the not too distant future. Most likely in 2014 15, it'll become the standard. Anyway, uh, I'm going to be moving on now. Just quickly to video memory. Video memory is pretty much exactly the same as RAM. It's just local to the video card. You usually have level one and whatever cache systems on the GPU or the graphics card as well, incidentally. Um, but you've also, of course, got the um, GDDR5 RAM. It used to be DDR4 and um, before that DDR3. Now we're on DDR5 which puts out more than enough memory bandwidth even for something like the GTX Titan, which of course is, I believe, the absolute fastest. It's either that or the GTX 690. I think they trade places depending how well the game scales in SLI. Uh, generally speaking, however, just in case you're tied and you've got the capital to buy one, I'd probably buy the Titan because they are easier to SLI. Um, in the future, you can have something like Tri SLI Titan. It's just for complete and utter stupidity in terms of graphics card processing. I don't really think you need that unless you've got, you know, an absolute massive 13 screen with running everything at absolute max. Anyway, um, as I was saying, and moving on for a second, we'll talk about other types of memory. So now you've got stuff like flash and USB memory. This is slower, it's fairly cheap, and obviously offers permanent storage. I don't really think I need to explain that one much more. Then you've got hard drives. Hard drives are pretty and damn slow, especially the physical ones. SSDs are a lot quicker. Problem with SSDs, of course, is that they are pretty expensive per gigabyte. Um, a lot of people now simply use regular hard drives for main storage, for example, movies they've downloaded or games or um, whatever they need to do, documents, and then they'll use the SSD for something like the games they frequently play or, for example, operating system or what have you. Um, it generally works quite well like that. Obviously, now you can start getting two, three terabyte hard drives quite easily, and the prices are reasonable. On the other hand, SSDs, you know, 256 gigabytes plus is quite expensive. Um, 
You can also run them in, say, RAID arrays, which basically splits the data over multiple drives, and in theory, well, not theory, it does access the data a lot quicker. So anyway, um, finally, then we have optical media or tape backups, that type of thing. They are basically the slowest you can possibly get. Optical media, for example, Blu-ray. One of the issues with, say, consoles is that they simply cannot stream effectively from a Blu-ray, even the... PS3 has this problem. That's why, for example, when you're playing Metal Gear Solid 4, you have to sit there watching Snake Smoke for like 5 or 10 minutes, because it's actually installing a data onto the hard drive. It's not doing it for fun. It's actually physically doing it because the hard drive data is needed to consistently load the game at a pace which makes it actually bearable for humans. Otherwise, you would be forever in a massive sluggish hell. So now we've talked about the overall memory itself so you guys have an understanding that there are different types of memory there are also others for example a bios memory as well which contains basic information on how your hardware works but i'm not really going to get into that in this particular video i don't really think it uh stuff like that doesn't really affect you as the end user anyway so let's talk a little bit more about caches as a whole in multi-process environments or multi-core environments as we now have for example the AMD Jaguar or, or even say the Q6600 which is several years old on the desktop or pretty much any of these others um, they actually have their own a dedicated amount of cache per core. For example let's take Intel's i7-3770 which is a pretty damn popular uh, chip right now it's the ivy bridge range um, it actually has two level one instructions one at level two and one level three so for example the level one uh, data cache would be four times 32 kb the level one instruction would be four times 32 kb so the same as the data level two is four times 256 KB and then finally the level uh, 3 would be 8 megabytes. Um, the level 1 data instruction and level 2 would be 8 way and the level 3 would be 16 way. So you guys can see just the difference there in terms of the amount there is. Obviously level 1 less latency and so forth but when it starts getting to the higher levels obviously there's a little bit more latency involved but a lot more memory as well the cache speed itself really depends upon uh, the CPU sometimes it will be running at say say the level 2 cache would be running at say 50% of the core clock speed and that type of thing now as it turns out of course memory is one of the big issues and I'm not just talking about memory a bandwidth but I'm talking the actual size what starts happening when you run out of a memory on your PC for example is generally speaking you're going to need to start using a virtual memory now the problem with virtual memory rather obviously is it is not real RAM we'll get into what virtual memory is in just a second however let's talk about memory itself now generally speaking on your PC desktop uh, how much memory you need really depends up on multiple factors including what you're actually doing ignore the graphics card for a second and let's talk about main system memory as it turns out, you need uh, an X64 uh, based operating system to address more than, say, 4 gigabytes of RAM. This, by the way, um, depending on the OS and everything else, usually does include video memory too. Um, for example, if we were to take a look at Windows 7 uh, Home Premium, just for example, it has a limit imposed on the X64 bit version of 16 gigabytes, on the other hand, 4 gigabytes on the x86 on the other hand ultimate um, is still got the 4 gigabyte limit on the x86 and on the x64 you've got 192 gigabytes now pretty much all processors now are 64 bit as it turns out i'm not going to get into exactly what the differences are in this video because that's more encroaching on the territory of well processors obviously but 
for now, all you need to know is that most applications you're going to be running, especially in games, are not really going to require more than 8 gigabytes of RAM as the time of my recording this in 2013. However, in two or three years' time, we don't really know. On the other hand, if you're doing something like very complicated video editing or very large images, um, and by large images, I'm not talking about making a desktop wallpaper I'm talking very 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 large uh, images with hundreds of layers plus or um, huge resolutions then you probably will find a major benefit of increasing the amount of memory you have on your system so anyway as I was saying memory virtual memory is simply a case of the memory itself runs out and Windows looks at all the applications you've got and says hmm you know what, I notice they have not switched to this application for a while, therefore I'm going to page it into the um, onto the virtual memory. In other words, it makes a copy of it onto the virtual memory to free up physical resources. This is a simple case of you have finite amounts of RAM. I don't care how much RAM you've got, I don't care if you've got 2 gigs of RAM or 64 gigabytes of RAM, you can fill it up. Um, if you try and even if you don't try you can quickly fill it up believe me so yeah um, that's all basically virtual memory is the problem with virtual memory is it is significantly slower than main system ram because obviously it is a paging a data from one to the other so in other words it has to basically rely upon your hard drive and how fast the hard drive is obviously ssds are going to be less in fact less impacted but still you're going to have a problem um as a slight aside and back in the day users were and by users i mean power users those interested in tweaking their pcs to the maximum don't you know we would go in and we'd actually set our own amount of virtual memory um how much was really up for debate actually uh some people would swear blind it was like you know two and a half times the system other people would say no 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 that's not enough other people would say four other people would go in and they'd say you know what i've got more than enough ram i don't need to worry i'm going to actually physically disable virtual memory and I'm going to deny Windows the temptation to ever page out. As it turns out, when you did that, even back in the day, you would actually cause some problems for certain applications in that they would simply crash or simply not load or they'd say you have insufficient amount of virtual memory, whatever. And indeed, that's why you will actually sometimes find that the size of your hard drive will, well, the amount of free space anyway, not the hard drive itself, will start to fluctuate as you're using Windows, even if you've not done anything, even if you've not installed any applications, it's simply because certain amounts of memory are being paged. As an aside, you'll be surprised at how much even a simple web browser can actually take up in terms of memory. For example, um, I've got multiple versions of Chrome open right now, and one of them is taking 266 megabytes of main system RAM. If you guys are curious or on how much memory you've got and you're using a Windows-based operating system, you do it a couple of ways, but I would just recommend right-clicking on taskbar, choosing Start Task Manager. You can then just look under Processes, and you can list by, list by memory. That's just a small exercise. Most of you probably know that, but I'm just saying, just in case you don't or you're a little bit curious. And as it turns out, most games now don't use more than 4 gigs of RAM. Most games are actually significantly less. I've given this story before, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, applications such as, say, Skyrim actually shipped with 2 gigabytes default. This is because of the nastiness known as not optimizing for PC. They did fix it by a set of patches. But as it turns out, because it physically couldn't address more than the amount of 2 gigabytes, certain high-resolution techniques mods and various mods in general actually would just be like yeah I don't know what to do with my life I'm going to commit suicide and they'd pretty much kill the application along with them um, and there was very little you could actually do about it apart from use a third-party mod or a third-party um, tweak if you will and that would pretty much get around it uh, but then Bethesda decided in their wisdom to actually release the damn uh, fix for it, so it became standard. Um, and yeah, I did kind of wonder at one point, um, 
this is back when Skyrim was first released, and I did wonder why, you know, why is my Skyrim taking so long? Because my friend was playing it on an Xbox, and I was playing it on the PC, and until, like, the day beforehand, I was loading a lot faster, and then suddenly, you know, I noticed my game was becoming increasingly sluggish after I installed a few mods, and I thought, that's weird. There's no way that my system is going to be struggling. I've got more than enough RAM. There's not even anything opening. Why the hell is it taking so long? And then it just kind of froze at the loading screen simply because it couldn't address the amount of memory that was required. As it turns out right now, most games are still 32-bit applications anyway. Indeed, there is actually applications around that you can actually use to change the application to address more than... Uh, the amount of memory it can. The problem is with that is it's a patch and actually it does change the executable along with other game files or therefore your game may not load because um, security problems and other bits and pieces. Generally speaking anyway most games are absolutely fine and they do not require it because we are not on next generation textures yet even on something like Crisis. By the way if you guys are bored and you are curious whether something is 32-bit or 64-bit you can once again go back go back to Windows Task Manager you can either do that the three-fingered salute way control alt delete and and choose task manager or you can be the more civilized way and right click on the windows taskbar of course at the bottom of the screen on any empty area start task manager go to processes and if it has a star 32 guess what that means that's right it's 32 bit and therefore can only access a certain amount of memory and then you laugh and point it and say ha 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 so anyway i think that just about covers everything on the uh, memory side, uh, at least this brief overview. I could definitely make this a lot more in depth. I'm probably going to do another video heavily going into what unified memory is. Uh, I was going to do it in this video, but it's already getting fairly lengthy. No doubt I'll waffle on for another five minutes anyway. Um, so, yeah. I will be covering that along with some other stuff to do with CPUs and stuff. Um, some of you probably already know this, um, you know, these uh, subjects quite well, but I figure it's good to cover it so that we're all on the same page because obviously um, I don't want to leave anyone behind. I have gotten a couple of comments on videos or a couple of messages saying that they like the videos that I'm putting out, which is really good and I'm really happy about that, but at the same time they feel that certain parts of the video they kind of tuned out not in a bad way, they simply just didn't understand what I was referring to. Um, you know, they may understand something like textures, but they may not understand what a, uh, a vertex is, or they may understand what memory bandwidth is, but they don't understand what cache is, or what have you, you get the general gist. And I don't really want that, because it's not good for anyone, it's not good for me as a, someone who's trying to educate or entertain because obviously I want you guys to watch all the video not start tuning out and say you know what this is just not for me and just click back at the same time I want to um, I, obviously if you guys already know what this stuff is and you don't have to watch the video so yeah that just about does it for this brief overview of memory as I said I will be doing further ones which will be going into more complicated subjects but this is just my first uh, video on uh, this subject so hopefully you've enjoyed it um, take care of yourselves bye for now and hopefully I'll see you around soon